Right. Thank you very much. Um, it is absolutely fabulous to be here back in the room and to see so many people. So uh, that is absolutely brilliant. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the National Trust uses GIS to deliver on our key strategies and objectives, and particularly on our response to climate change. As I say, we're going to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we don't have time for questions, unfortunately, but do come and find us afterwards. And actually, the whole, whole National T Trust team is here, so uh, do, do stop and speak to some of these guys as well. So, first, a little bit about National Trust, if you're not familiar with us. Um, I did bring the membership forms, actually, but if you want to <laughs> join, um, we, I'm sure we'd love to have you. Uh, we celebrated our 125th anniversary last year, and NT is rooted in the idea of three Victorian philanthropists who fundamentally wanted to ensure that all people had access to fresh air, history, nature, and beauty. And that idea took off, uh, and since then, we've acquired some of the finest environmental and historic assets to look after on behalf of the nation. We now look after around 1.5% of the land area of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Uh, and the figures on the screen kind of speak for themselves. There's, there's really a lot to, to look after. Um, we have set ourselves some quite challenging and stretching uh, targets and objectives, working um, significantly ahead of government targets in this area. Uh, I won't read them all out to you. You can see them on the screen. And we'll cover many aspects of these as we run through the presentation. So when I spoke to this conference, I think it was five years ago, I ran through some of the evidence for climate change and the biodiversity crisis. Um, clearly, from everything we've, we've heard this morning, I don't need to do that now. Um, the science is really, really clear, and you'll all be taking some form of action in your own organizations. What I did want to do is talk a little bit about the real-life impacts we are seeing in the National Trust now across our properties. And then Gareth will take us through why GIS is such a critical tool for us to help us make evidence-based decisions to respond to climate change now. So the rapid increase in heat and humidity being experienced now means that 40 degree days could become common by 2040. And that impacts everything from the garden, altering the types of plants um, that we introduce um, to, to include those more resilient to high temperatures, to the house, such as this one here, Ham House in London, which has large south-facing windows that mean there will be parts of the year uh, the, the house will have to be closed because it will be too hot to working, and it also is putting our collections at risk from uh, sun and heat damage and new pests and diseases. We're also seeing an increase in wildfire, and Gareth will talk about that in a moment. Um, so the bottom uh, right-hand uh, screen shows a barn uh, in, in, in the Yorkshire Dales, uh, similar to one which collapsed as a result of subsidence and, and soil shrinkage. Um, we're seeing uh, a, a lot more of that and, and seeing buildings collapse that previously weren't classified as being in a poor state of repair. Uh, we're also seeing increased landslides and erosion. So in 2014, the chalk cliffs at Burling Gap here um, saw seven years' worth of erosion in just two months, um, in part due to some heavy storms. So we're already seeing more extreme weather events, uh, as the chap from the Met Office talked about earlier. Storms are expected to cause issues for falling trees in the future especially as extreme weather leaves them weakened uh, and more susceptible to disease, to disease like ash dieback, uh, with falling branches a particular hazard for visitors. Regular long dry spells followed by heavy downpours has led to increased flooding around Lyme Park in the bottom corner there, um, with flooded gardens and water pouring into the mansion. And I could go on and talk about more extreme weather, but the point is that we are seeing these impacts right now, and we need to know how to respond and adapt to them. So if that all sounds a little bit apocalyptic and a bit gloomy, I'm sorry, but that is the, the burning platform we're standing on. But there is hope. Uh, there are lots of adaptations and mitigations we can put into place. And the next section is about our response. Internally, we've chosen to articulate our response to climate change through this simple mnemonic, RACE. Uh, we want to reduce, adapt, capture, and engage. It's our climate race to protect nature, beauty, and history for everyone forever. And the Trust recognizes that a strong evidence and research-based response to these issues is critical in maximizing the impact of our charitable resources. Climate change is a geographical challenge, and GIS has a massive role in helping all of us respond. So Gareth is now going to take you through some examples of our response to climate change and show how Esri ArcGIS is making a huge impact to our work. Gareth. Thank you. So the Carbon Dashboard is a groundbreaking tool for the Trust brings together a wide range of spatial and non-spatial data from multiple sources, including land use, agriculture, and habitats. As a land-owning organization, land use is a big area of emissions for us. So we've used international carbon counting standards and methodologies and applied them to our work. 
We've used Tableau software, which is our organizational BI platform, to build a dashboard. It presents a picture of carbon based against baseline scales from the whole trust to individual property. It highlights areas for improvement, so you can see whether you work in procurement, say, or if you're a property manager, exactly where you are against those targets. And with this, hopefully, we can help chart our path to be net zero by 2030. Something that's been a bit of a game changer that we've been working on a little while back, um, with an aim to adapting to some of those challenges that we talked about, is um, with Freak Hill and a range of our partners and consultants, um, we've been developing a climate change hazard map. It's intended really as a flagging tool, highlighting the danger of um, non-intervention by comparing information from now alongside that that could develop without any um, future mitigating action. It looks primarily at four key areas. Overheating, slope failure, soil heave, and storm damage. The data used is primarily sourced from the Met Office, we heard about them earlier, and the British Geological Survey. The current picture being taken from a 1981 to 2010 baseline, with the future picture being based on a projection from 2060 to 2080. It uses the simple five kilometer hexagonal grids that you see there, with five broad categories of risk, graded and color coded, with blue being the least change and red being the most affected. Whilst at an individual property scale, this doesn't necessarily um, sort of differentiate a lot. It does act as an effective overall planning tool and helps highlight key regional themes. It's that broader brush simplicity of it that allows it to reach the greater audience and hopefully act as a useful conversation starter in pursuit of any climate action. The key headline findings from it can certainly act as a bit of a concern. Um, so for the National Trust, the, oops, sorry, uh, the, let's uh, that down. There we go. Yeah, so for the National Trust, where we were at high or medium risk um, properties, they increased from 30 to 71% by 2060. But as stated before, this was based on no climate action. So this tool begins to help spatially define where we can actually do something about that and where there are exciting opportunities to work with neighboring landowners, partner organizations, or governments to ensure that it's a joined up approach. Another good example that our team, um, notably Keith Chalice, our remote sensing specialist, have been working on um, to help us develop some of these threats, is the Wildlife Risk Dashboard. Using ArcGIS Dashboard integrated with ArcGIS Online, we've collected sources from the Living Atlas to view alongside our places to help us gauge real-time threats posed by wildfires. So the central viewer here um, allows us to look at the country as a whole and identify areas historically prone to wildfires. This can be used alongside other data sets to create risk maps helpful in knowing where to best direct resources and combat future occurrences. On the left, you have information brought in from the European Forest Fire Information System um, with layers such as those for land cover type, protected areas, human settlement, um, and also lower down there, you've also got the sources of the fuels of the fires. There's also um, a damage report that can help you highlight um, where there's been potential damage in the last uh, day, week, or month. And then um, you can select it on the map by clicking on the drop down and it'll highlight um, that area for you. And then finally, alongside um, graphical information for thermal hotspots, there is a general situation viewer that shows a near-life picture of thermal hotspots identified and brought in alongside the Sentinel Hub imagery. NT properties have been added to that view and thermal events highlighted in red with a size based on intensity. Locations of key sites of interest, shown here in Northern Ireland or Yorkshire, where there's been larger scale incidents recently with wildfires, have been bookmarked so they can be more directly monitored. And alongside the true color image there, you've also got the NDVI and the um, soil moisture, which can help um, to sort of um, indicate the fuels and the combustibility element there, so that um, it can really help direct the sources on the ground. So one of the challenges brought about by climate change, as you mentioned, is the new rise in pests and diseases. A prevalent example of this in recent years for us has been the rise in a whole suite of diseases affecting trees, with the most noticeable being ash dieback. Um, so as well as the cost associated with managing this, it's also important for us to think about where these trees are and how that interacts with access for people, with many of the popular paths winding their way through the wooded areas. We've responded to this with increased monitoring. Using ArcGIS 
field uh, maps app, we have enabled our rangers to go out into the field and capture data on our tree safety management app. Data can be remotely captured and then synced back in the office. This app, and hopefully future ones like it, will go a long way towards helping us meet those challenges and provide a central, consistent, and trustable source of information. This can then help us inform future decisions at a larger landscape on national scale for us. Here's one of our lead rangers, Max, to explain a little more, more about how he uses the Tree Safety Management app. So the Tree Safety Management app is an app which allows us to record and collect information on individual trees during assessing. So if we notice a tree that has um, certain defects, uh, we are able to record those defects and then ensure that we can uh, get the tree surgeon out in good time to complete the work and ensure that the tree remains safe. It makes us as a ranger team far more efficient with our work. Rather than putting all of the information down on a piece of paper and then into a computer system and doing that twice, it means we can do it once and once only. Um, it makes life so much easier. It ensures that we can get contractors out even quicker. Everyone's really got on board with the app and they are enjoying using it. It's simple to use and it's quick. It's improved people's job and their enjoyment of it because when they're spending, able to spend more time outside rather than being in the office completing paperwork. So one of the projects that I've enjoyed being involved in the most is the capturing of the habitat actions as part of our land, outdoors and nature programme. Every element of it has been like living through the progression of the real life Lawton principles of bigger, better, more. It's planning, everything from planning and drawing on paper maps with ecologists, right through to digitising these so that they can be measured and reported on across the whole organisation and viewed alongside other data using a geocortex powered browser right the way through to going out with the rangers and actually mapping the precise locations of not just theoretical anymore, but real new ponds or hibernacular or giant bug hotels. So excitingly, this is really starting to happen now on the ground, which is one of the growing number of things which is making me feel much more hopeful for the future, that ourselves and many other organisations, um, many represented here today with common goals and visions, are actually now starting to make this happen. As you mentioned, one of our key ambitions and priorities is to look for land opportunities and for improving nature and increasing carbon. Deciding how and where these interventions at landscape scale is, where they put them, is critical. So one recent example of a way to help with this strategic planning has been the development of the Sustainable Land Management Tool. We've created an attribute-rich vector data model in ArcGIS Pro that's brought together over 40 data inputs ranging from National Trust land management and condition data sets through to open data sets and predictive model outputs from external sources. It's enabled the organisation to evaluate all its land against common metrics and helped co-design a suite of nature accelerator places. And these represent the biggest current opportunities for us to deliver at a wider scale. Previously, our intranet-based GIS, often limited in scope and scale, um, often led to the use of disparate data sources, I think, um, and sort of analysis performed in different ways, in different regions, and potential for unnecessary replication. So now shareable as a web map, data and evidence-driven insights are helping to drive the strategy formation and critical decision-making at this whole organisational scale. It's allowed for a range of technical and non-technical users from different parts of the organisation to interact with the data, both internal and external, and crucially working in that common format. <coughs> This flexibility has empowered the end users to drive their own insights. So one final thing to quickly mention um, that we've been looking at as part of our Blossom program and campaign, which aims to reflect and um, help us celebrate our connection with nature, culture, and each other at a time of year when renewal is so evident all around us, is a project to look at the locations of traditional orchards. Orchards are of particular importance because they provide the perfect home for a variety of birds, pollinators, insects, as well as being great for people. So working with Arch AI, our team, in particular Chris Word, working with Tom Domit, have been piloting a project um, using artificial intelligence and deep learning to try and identify uh, locations of orchards using historic mapping, modern mapping, and other data sources. Um, it's sort of still underway, and we're still an analyzing the results, but certainly, if pretty successful, it's a technique that we may adopt for um, other land types and lots of other analysis 
So um, potential for lots of other exciting opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. Um, I hope that is a useful kind of overview of some of the ways that Esri's GIS is helping the National Trust look after special places in the context of climate change. Um, and before we go on to a summary and finish, I just wanted to pick up Gareth's final point there on uh, engagement and actually what I would call data and GIS leadership. So if we see climate change as a real and existential threat, uh, which I'm pretty sure most of us do, then we're probably thinking about what we can do in our own roles in responding to that. And it's perhaps uh, easy for me to say when National Trust has a, as a, as a decent-sized comms and marketing function, um, but we all have a story to tell in our own roles. And when I look around the conference and I talk to other people, I can see there is so much brilliant stuff going on that we, we ought to shout about. And I think increasingly, the ArcGIS online platform with features like web maps, hub, and story maps make it really easy for us to tell those stories and they literally give us a platform. So my experience is that there is a huge appetite out there for data stories, such as the hazard maps and the blossom analysis. We put the hazard map out there last year, uh, thinking that it might get picked up by the newspapers if it was a, a slow news day, um, you know, uh, and uh, you know, perhaps it wasn't that groundbreaking and people wouldn't be interested. Um, but we were so wrong about that. Um, it, it had a massive impact. It, it was picked up um, widely in the media um, and it was um, you know, followed and shared by our supporters and the general public. And I think one of the reasons for that is that people are looking for a bit of hope and solutions to what can be quite a gloomy and scary news story, um, and also to try and help find clarity and some simplicity in what can be quite a confusing and complex area. So I guess my message is, um, you know, you're all doing brilliant things. Um, we've got this great platform and tools from Esri, so let's show how we are using GIS um, and data uh, and hopefully change the world a little bit. So, to quickly sum up, uh, we know we must take action now, and GIS and spatial data is absolutely mission critical for the National Trust to ensuring we do the right things in the right places. We've talked about the carbon dashboard using spatial data uh, and how that's giving us real visibility and power to act at all levels of the organization to get to carbon net zero by 2030. We've shown how the hazard map built on AGOL is helping us understand climate risk and take action, uh, and how ArcGIS field maps is keeping visitors safe. We've talked about the predictive analytical capabilities of ArcGIS to understand the best places to make land use interventions, and we've covered how we can use data stories and the Esri platform to tell powerful stories that people really want to hear. So I hope that's been a useful dash through uh, a few areas. Please do get in touch with us or come and find one of the team today if you want to talk about it a bit more or you have any other questions.